Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 490, featuring an interview with George MacDonald. No, not the Scottish novelist, the uh, game developer. Well, actually, he's a producer, developer, designer, you name it. Uh, he probably got his uh, start, or sort of uh, one of the early things he's known for, is the Champions uh, superhero role-playing game system. I know a lot of you guys have uh, played that. Uh, he went on to work at SSI doing the Gold Box, Pool of Radiance, and then on to the Black Box, uh, Eye of the Beholder series, and much, much more. I mean, he's got incredible experiences and stories and advice and uh, just great insights. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview, so without further ado, here is George McDonald. All right, folks, look who I am here with tonight, George McDonald. <laughs> I am hey, really excited about this this little chat. George, you've worked on some, you've been a producer, a developer, designer, you name it, writer. I see you even do some did some clue books here. Some of my favorite games of all time. You know, it was somebody had commented, George, when I said, no, I'm interviewing this guy. You know, check out this. Out. I'm so excited. And they're like, well, you should be excited. You know, the first Matt chat you ever did, the first video you did was Pool the Radiance. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> Here's one of the guys that was instrumental in making that making that happen. But hey, we got a lot of stuff we want to get into. But just how are you doing today, George? Thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Matt. Um, doing well today. I want to make sure to thank Sue Manley. I guess you you know her pretty well. Uh, Sue was uh, worked at SSI in the art department while, while I was there for many years. She's been just fantastic getting uh, help me find you know, guests for the program. So definitely want to give her a very loud shout out and thanks. All right, George. So how did you get a, you know, I know you uh, did some stuff before you got into uh, computer, the computer side of things. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the tabletop games, but even, even before we get into that, though, how did you come to role playing games? Well, I started as a Hex Encounter war game player. Uh, one of my best friends, his mom bought a copy of Panzer Blitz for 50 cents at a, a garage sale. And we scratched our head and tried to figure it out. And that led us into all kinds of other historical games. And then uh, that put me into the same stores and hanging with the same people when the uh, original box set of, you know, three book Dungeons and Dragons came out. So we picked that up and played around with that for a while. And I was always a tinkerer. So for many years, I kept trying to write other rules that I thought would make the game better and could never get people to use my kind of rules except for me. And so at some point I wrote my own entire rule set, which became the, uh, the game Champions and the company Hero Games, which myself and uh, Steve Peterson started and did that for about five years. And then... Uh, you know, George, there's probably a lot of folks that tinkered around with the rules, but not many of their tinkerings ended up as <laughs> their own published game. That's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, it was just a tremendous amount of fun. And then uh, one of the things that happened is several of people who worked at SSI were people who'd played champions. And I met them at convent local conventions and uh, played games with them on occasion. And when TSR started shopping around the Dungeons and Dragons license for computer role playing games, uh, the people that I had played with called me up and said, hey, we're looking for uh, another, what was at the time called, you know, producer, assistant producer, and to work on computer role-playing games. Uh, would you be interested? And I had 
played computer role playing games, but hadn't been involved in building any of them yet, but went in, did the interview and SSI was into historical war games and role playing games. And I was as well. So kind of match made in heaven. <laughs> yeah, I'll say that's, that's just great. It's just, I mean, I know you probably worked on probably about as many war games and looking at some of the other stuff on your bibliography, a lot of role-playing stuff, but also a lot of strategy. I just said, before we move on, I want to talk a little bit more about this Champions game. You know, sure. I saw some interviews. I've seen you've been interviewed about that a few times. I mean, because it's a very popular, very successful thing. I saw you described yourself in one of those interviews, uh, George, as a games mechanic fanatic. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's yes. fair. <laughs> uh, but this game, you know, it's, it's kind of that genre of uh, superheroes. You know, I know that's, you know, some of those reading the Wikipedia page too, and something I've thought about. And there haven't been, I mean, there's been a few successful superhero CRPGs, you know, computer role-playing games over the years, but it doesn't seem to have had the success as the fantasy games or the science fiction. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit maybe about some of the challenges, making a good superhero, like what makes that genre different? Sure. Well, later in my career, I did actually spend a couple of months. It wasn't a long period of time um, at Cryptic, the people who made the City of Heroes oh, yeah. uh, MMO, which I was a big fan of and, and played a big. Uh, and they were Champions fans. So, again, uh, it was good to have a connection there. Um, trying to do a superhero game has the complexity of it's like doing a very high fantasy game or a very advanced technology sci-fi game because the a, a variety of stuff that you want to allow the players to do is incredibly broad. You really want them breaking the rules in of kind of normal life lots of different ways. I mean, yes, people can fly and yes, people can punch things, but you want the invite. You want them to be able to impact the environment, which is expensive in a computer sense. You want them to be able to impact players in a variety of different ways. Whether you're, um, you know, people tend to have very specific attacks and defenses, and you want characters to feel very uh, unique. And every time you try to make something unique in a computer game, it's expensive. You need unique code, unique assets unique sound effects, unique interfaces. So in a lot of ways, trying to do a good superhero game is among the more complex and expensive, expensive genres to try to do. Because um, you not only have to do a pretty good job at just doing reality, but you have to do a really engaging, excellent job at doing super reality as well. It seemed like you nailed it with this game. As we said, it's been, you know, it's still actively played. As a matter of fact, I know people that still play City of, he City of Heroes. There's a way you can still play that. But, but anyway, one of the things in this game, I thought, you know, coming back to your game mechanic fanatic, <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> I hope that'll be kind of the theme, really. Uh, but, you know, this game has uh, a point by mm -hmm. system I was reading about. One of the things that, you know, Wikipedia says it's the first ever point by system it was early whether it was the first or not you know there's lots of things that happened around that time but it wasn't something you had seen yourself before right you um i was there was actually uh some inspiration for somebody who had done uh sort of partial point buys beforehand um, so I'm sure I was inspired by other games of the time that I had seen. It was many years ago, so trying to remember exactly the names of every one of them, I'm sure I would leave something out. So I think uh, every game designer, you know, it's the old stands on shoulders of giants. Sure. <laughs> stuff that came before. Oh, I know all about that. You know, I, wrote, I tried writing a book about 
I mean, the book came out, but you know, it's, it's history of computer role playing games is kind of my my thing. And every time somebody asks me, like, who was the first, you know, what was the first, and no matter what it is, you know, <laughs> it seemed like it, there's always something before, and it's just really hard. But but one thing about the point by system, again, coming back, I think the interview was in rock paper scissors or rock paper shotgun. Mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, but you. You know, they were asking you about this point by system. And you said that it was, uh, you liked it because it was fair. You know, and you thought it was unfair, to, I guess, in regular Dungeons and Dragons, where if you have, <laughs> if you have a really strict Dungeon Master anyway, where they're like, no, you're going to play, you know, whatever you roll, that's, you're stuck with that character. I, I suppose part of it was I wanted the flexibility to find the thing in between that classic um, character classes were, I mean, they were much more rigid back in the day than they are now. Now you have a lot more options and choices to make in a fifth ed character than you did back in original D&D. &D. Um, and the idea that there were trade-offs that you could make and that you could fine tune the thing that you wanted to role play or that your character could grow based on their experiences in ways that seemed reasonable to the story. So if you had done an adventure with somebody who was a master melee fighter and you wanted to spend your experience points buying up a level in melee fighting, while in a different experience you hung with the great world's greatest detective and you wanted to buy up your detective skill well, in a pure character class system that's more challenging to do uh, especially at the time in the point by system that just sort of laid everything out and so it was kind of a matter of can we simulate everything at some level of detail that somebody might bring up in a kind of adventure like story mm -hmm. and that was what the superhero game kind of grew into what we called the hero system. And then we use that system for fantasy games, modern adventure games, even giant robot games and sci-fi games and cyberpunk and all kinds of other things. Um, and a lot of times my job was to come up with, you know, oh, we're moving into a new genre. How will we do a car chase? Or we're about to go do... Uh, modern spies well how exactly do guns work and what's the difference between a shotgun and a you know automatic rifle and how do you make that feel to the character like there's a difference in a way that people who know about that stuff um, are going to have at least at least say okay there's some level of acceptable um it's, it's never reality, but it's, I'm willing to accept this as a reasonable result so that I don't, I can keep playing. I can keep going through the story. I'm not thrown out of the story by something dumb. You know, I mean, how many times have you read a, a novel by somebody and a bit of detail comes up about a thing that you know a lot about and they get it wrong <laughs> and it just throws you out of the story. And the no. same thing happens in games. The same thing happens with game masters. Um, so you just, as a game designer, you try to make the thing close enough so that people who know the real thing will go, okay, I'll give them that and go on and continue your immersion. You know, I always laugh and almost brace myself for impact when <laughs> there's a i'm watching a tv show and there's if the theme is like video games or computer games because it, it's, it's inevitably they'll have the sounds they'll make it sound like it was some arcade game from the early 80s <laughs> Even though it's like, you know so this could be a, a show that comes out yesterday it still has that but uh, yeah this this uh, point by system was was great i see it used all over the place and what you're talking about there this trying to walk that line you know i've heard a lot of designers talk about this over the years you know you, you want it to be somewhat faithful to or to, you know the fidelity is accuracy is important something some games more than others but on the other hand uh some stuff's just not fun 
yeah. You, know, you, can get, you can get carried away. And, you know, I, I th- always thought maybe that would be less of a problem, at least in terms of uh, the calculations and, you know, some of the mathematics that has to take place on a computer because a computer could just do all that for you uh, versus in a tabletop game, you know, you can't get too, you, know, you can't be, <laughs> well, this will require some calculus, you know, we're going to use. <laughs> right. I, I think the trade-off you make there is that in the tabletop game, you can make things that are a little more exception driven where the game master and the player will kind of deal with the edge cases in a, without you having to specify them to the exact degree but you have to simplify the math and the interactions because they're going to have to do this on the tabletop. Whereas in the computer game, you can make the math as complicated as you want, but you need to specify for the developers every edge case to the nth degree, um, or you get into a situation where the simulation falls apart. Let's jump into... Road War Europa. <laughs> Hold up here. Well, that's not a very good, uh, it's kind of blurry, but this has got actually got an awesome looking cover on this. Mm-hmm. Oh, there we go. That looks better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't want to play this game? Huh? Of course, this is the sequel, I guess, to Road War. The Road War 2000. Yes. Yeah, this, it is, you know, I don't hear enough about this this uh, this little series here because you know you hear I guess about auto duel and sometimes you hear, hear about car wars and stuff like that but it's really interesting this is a really early example of this sort of genre here mm-hmm. so how'd you get a how did all this come about for you well when I joined strategic simulations one of the first games that I was assigned was Road War Europa and part of it was the it was a sequel so the person who developed the original who was developing the sequel kind of knew what they were doing there wasn't a lot of we weren't pioneering a lot of new things there were some new features and details in it but the core kind of game mechanics in it were had been established in the first game and the tool set for creating the game kind of already existed Mm -hmm. the map i mean ssi had a set of uh, standard map routines for dealing with war games and such and so really the tactical part of the combat for this was use the war game uh part of their libraries and then the overland map again kind of was another was the same thing it was the square grid um kind of war game map library but just applied to a large um, adventuring space. And, you know, in a lot, my inputs to that were mostly just trying to make sure the testing was done well, occasional suggestions about things to streamline it. But I was a very green assistant producer at the time. Um, so I was just, you know, glad to have an opportunity to, to get a product through from from begin, effectively beginning to end. Um, I, years ago, James Dunnigan, who was probably the greatest war game, hex and counter war game designer of my era, who used to work for help, was one of the co-owners of SPI, said, you know, experience is equal to games ruined. And <laughs> my, my version of that was experience is equal to games shipped. You know, so this was my first one, and I was really happy that uh, SSI put me on it, and I could uh, get it out the door, and I learned a lot. It looks good. Yeah, there's uh, I got the Amiga version here. I guess there was a couple. This this was back in the day when you had like six or seven different ports of every game, right? Yeah, it, it's we they normally started on the Apple II because the 48K Apple II kind of had the smallest memory footprint of any of the 8-bit systems. We normally supported uh, 48K Apple IIs, uh, Commodore 64s, and 64K Atari 800s. 
And so we would do the Apple II version first to make sure everything fit. And then we would use the same sort of map libraries and things like that to port the game over to Commodore 64. And then I, I don't know if we did an Atari version of uh, Road War or not. Uh, Atari ST is listed here. Right. Hoping so then what that's worth. And then what would happen is there were different um, development houses that knew the 16-bit 16, the 16 systems. The original developer really knew the 8-bit the Apple II and Commodore 64. And then we would hire um, third-party development houses to make the Atari ST and Commodore uh, Amiga and sometimes later the PC. <clears throat> that was when the kind of C64 and Apple II were the main uh, SKUs for the game. And then mm -hmm. later on, within a couple of years, it was like, well, the PC was the main SKU, and then you do ST and Amiga to go with that. Um, or you'd have a development house that had, you know, great tools, and they could do Apple II, or they could do uh, PC and Atari, ST and Amiga kind of in, in parallel. I was looking at see Westwood did some of that, some of that work for uh, SSI, right? Yeah, Westwood, I mean, the uh, Questron 2 was one of their games, started on the Commodore 64. Um, and then they did a kind of 3D visualization block that we ended up using in the gold box game, starting with Cool Radiance, where they licensed us a, so the, the little 3D point of view module in those gold box games were original, was originally created by Westwood. Really? Mm -hmm. On that, I did not know. Yeah, it was just super clever use of, you know, redefining character sets and, you know, dividing the 3D view into layers and, you know, translating a 16 by 16 square map where you could have a wall on any flat surface um, into something that you could do on Commodore 64 or Apple II. And uh, it really gave the Gold Box games a unique look for Commodore 64 games at the time, for 8-bit games at the time. So that's pretty awesome, kind of mind blowing, really. <laughs> Didn't know that. Um, you mind if I ask you just a quick question about Road War? Sure. I know you worked on Europa, but you know the first game. I'm kind of I always wondered. You know, surely that must be inspired or kind of an homage to the movie Death Race, two thousand, or is that just a coincidence? <laughs> you know that. Road War 2000 was kind of before my time at SSI, so I don't know what the original, History. you know, inspirations for it were. There was a lot of that kind of stuff ro rolling around at that time in the culture, so. It's a crazy movie. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And the Mad Max movies, you oh, know, especially with the kind of after the Holocaust feel to them and. Yeah, those are some of my favorite movies. Here's the Questron. This is Questron 2. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good series. So this kind of gave you uh, some experience working on computer role-playing games before the you know, Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds and all that. Oh, there's a Blackjack oh. game. Road, Road War was effectively a role-playing game, too. It was just you were kind of upgrading cars instead of upgrading characters. You'd have a party of vehicles. Mm -hmm. this is, yep. um, so you know, a, a lot of the mechanics and the rhythms of the game were very much a role-playing game with a big overall map and a tactical combat map. And, you know, in a lot of ways... There were a bunch of games like that that SSI did, partially because those were the kind of games that the people that were associated with SSI liked. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot of people there that were into strategy games, so they wanted very strategic, tactical combat. Um, and then they wanted the role playing side because they were a lot in a lot of cases pencil and paper role playing, tabletop role playing people. Mm-hmm. So it was a way to combine two things that lots of people at the company enjoyed doing. You know, some of these games kind of blur the line. Should there even be a line? You know, I was just thinking with a lot of, especially back in these days, they're, they sort of emerged from the wargaming community, right? So, of course, they would be interested in both sorts of games. Oh, Dungeons and Dragons grew out of tabletop miniatures and chain mail. So, mm-hmm. there's okay. a lot of those a third of the there. Of the <laughs> if I ever do a third edition of uh, Dungeons and Desktops, we'll put a road war <laughs> for sure uh, let's get uh, get uh move into uh my favorite game though really is just you know pool of radiance wow um when the ssi awesome. ssi got the license for to do an advanced dungeons and dragons game um it, we all knew this was a huge deal mm. uh, because, you know, Dungeons and Dragons was super well known, but the expectations on the game were very high in terms of people wanted the game to feel like D&D. They wanted this, this, all the feedback we got from, you know, users and people we would talk to and say what kind of game we were building. It was just, we want it to be as D&D as you can do, given the limitations of a computer and so you know that's why we wanted to go could we have combat we took all the original like in road war europa and the standard uh, ssi square map system all of the units were 16 by 16 pixels or two by two characters so we said well so SSI had a game or had a, a pair of games that um, Keith Bors and I'm trying to remember who else worked with him on that. Paul Murray had done for, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, Wizard's Crown, is that what you're thinking? Yes, Wizard's Crown and Eternal Dagger. And that was a another kind of role-playing game where you had the overland map using the square grid system. And then you had the tactical combat using the square grid system. And uh, both uh, Keith and Paul were really smart, really good, uh, both role players and war gamers and computer programmers. And one of the things there was a lot of things in Pool of Radiance that got kind of inspired by the work that they'd done on uh, Wizard's Crown and Eternal Dagger. Mm -hmm. But when we looked at it, we said those games, the characters were two by two characters and they weren't really high def, very high definition. I mean, even for the time, it was a little hard to tell them apart. So we decided to make everybody three by three just to give ourselves some more room to create uh, characters and then had the character editor so you could feel like you were quote painting your own miniature um, yeah. as part of the game yeah and there's the the editing screen that went with that um, so that was you know there were things like that we made the characters a little bigger than we had before we made the basic moving around in 3d you know pseudo 3d um, instead of uh, the overhead map in order to make you feel more like you were, quote, in a dungeon or, or in the city as you were moving through things. Um, and then, of course, you know, character classes. What can we do? What levels can we have people go to? What spells can we support? How do we make them feel as much like the actual AD&D spells of the time um, you know, that was just something everybody in the development group that was involved played the game and we kind of knew how those things worked. 
And there was always a question of, you know, can we add this one more thing that's going to make it more D and D like, um, and that was, that was just our goal. And now those, everybody that was involved kept trying to find ways to make that happen. I think you nailed it. Do you, do you remember, were there things that, you know, like, oh, we can't do that or, uh, <laughs> that would be cool, but you know, we got these limitations. I mean, did that sort of thing happen. Oh, it happened all the time, but often you would try to use that to make more, find another choice. Like we wanted to be able to tell a richer story if the character, if they cared about it, because mm -hmm. we weren't sure what things people were really going to care about. You know, was it just the tactical combat? Was it the character interactions? Was it the world that you were in? Was it the motivations? Was it describing the bad guys? Uh, was it mapping? What what did you what were people going to care about? So one of the things we did was because the the disk drives at the time had such limited capacity on them, uh, we didn't have room to put a lot of text in there, and we didn't want to force the user to read story text if they didn't want to, but we wanted to make it available for people who did. And that's where the whole journal idea came from, where you would find journal entry 23, and then you could go, if you wanted to, read some things about the background or see a map that we had drawn in the journal itself, or you know, just give you something that added depth to the experience of being in the world. Yep. Yep. You know, I think, I wish the game still had these. Uh, you know, I play a lot of computer role-playing games that are classics as well as modern but you know like you say i don't necessarily even if i think it's good writing and i enjoy the story and everything i don't necessarily want to sit there and read like page after page of text <laughs> you know this is nice because i can you know kick back with this you know it's like reading a real book <laughs> i don't know a real book with pages are out of order i'm not the only one <laughs> who sees value in it. <laughs> no i have heard it said that these were let me just back up a little bit because when I got, um, maybe I'm kind of unusual uh, because when I played Pool of Radiance, I had never played Dungeons and Dragons. Hmm. Okay. So that was my first exposure, if you will, to all of this. So I learned to play, you know, Dungeons and Dragons by reading the manuals and the <laughs> adventures and journals and clue books. So. <laughs> You know, I don't know, maybe my experience is, is a, a little bit biased, you know, but <laughs> wow, did that game suck me in? <laughs> yeah, um, you, you talked about clue books there. That was one of my responsibilities for a number of the games was I wrote the Pool of Radiance clue book and then uh, it, uh, the Curse of the Azure Bonds and some of the other ones that went with it, Eye of the Beholder one most of the games that i was kind of being one of the senior producers on i would end up writing the the rule book and the clue book to go with it and in the beginning before the pool of radiance clue book there were concerns was anybody going to really want this you know was there going to be a lot of demand for it Are you kidding? and wow. because i came from the the tabletop and the pencil and paper background i said oh these are going to sell like hotcakes. You know, I'm pretty sure I got at least one copy of each one. I mean, to, to me, it was part of the game. You buy the game, you buy the clue book. Usually, you know, there's a store called uh, Electronics Boutique. Yep. <laughs> I'd yep. go there and like, okay, usually you have at least one game a year. So it's my birthday. So we're going to get the Pool of Radiance or Curse and you got to have the clue book. <laughs> I, I didn't think any, you know, some people, I, I guess they think it's kind of, uh, I don't know, like uh, the real pros don't need the clue book or something like that. Or it's, I don't know. I never got that. That was never my experience. To me, it just enhanced the whole game having the clue book. You know, I don't know. How, how do you feel about it? I've never minded a good walkthrough. I don't necessarily want to, read and slavishly follow every element of it but mm -hmm. um i'll find for a lot of games if i'll roll through the game on my own and seem to be doing fine and i'm happy with the way things are going and then i'll hit something 
that doesn't feel right. Like, wow, this battle is just way harder than all the battles that I've had up till now. Or this enemy is doing things that just completely are baffling me. I'm not, or this puzzle, I must be missing something. And I'll puzzle at it for a while and I'll try a couple of times against an opponent. But at some point, I want to get on with the game. And so if I can find a walkthrough or uh, uh, something else, I mean, one of the reasons why in the gold box games, there's a difficulty setting is that you can literally roll through the game come to a fight that you just can't win, turn the difficulty way down, win it. And then if you want to turn it back up to where you were before, that's fine. You, you play the game. It's your game. Enjoy it kind of a thing. And on the other hand, if you want to actually, if you know what you're doing, you want to turn the difficulty up a little bit, you're just going to get that much more experience and stuff. And your characters are going to get powerful that much more quickly. And you know, that that's a, you can feel good about defeating the game on a higher difficulty level. So, you know, I you was know. granted, I was probably like 12, <laughs> maybe 13, but, you know, I, I, even with the clue book, I don't know if I tried to adjust the difficulty, but I mean, those are some, there were some challenges. <laughs> you know, this guy's the clue book might say, here's some things you might try, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, those trolls! On, on the trolls and ogre fight. Uh, uh, I still remember that. Regenerating trolls, pain <laughs> in the river. Yeah, just the you know the clue book. Yeah, we, we could go on about that, but yeah, it was it's kind of fun to think that you wrote those because <laughs> I was like studying them so intensely back in the day. Now I have heard it said that the and of course there was a code wheel. Hmm. You know the the code wheels here, but uh, I always thought I was wondered. You know, if part of this this was, uh, you know, to kind of prevent the uh, the pirates. Yeah, I would say that that would absolutely. I mean, the physical code wheel, the physical adventures journal, uh, were all things that made the experience better. This guy's gone in there. This copy of the guys is the. Uh, Mark the ones that are real. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or I guess the ones because you put some some fake ones in here too, right? The, mm-hmm. Throw people off. I remember there was one that was kind of I don't know if it's this one, but there was one that kind of sounded a little a little bit spicy. <laughs> You're like, hmm, well, how do I get to that? <laughs> <laughs> we had fun with some stuff. I bet it was fun just writing the manuals too. Um, manual writing is its own kind of art form because, and this is something that I, I did wrong early on and I think got better as I went along, which is there's a, the easiest way to do something is describe here are all the features of the game that are in front of you. Mm-hmm. you now, here's all the options and here's what they all do. But really what the player wants and what anybody hopefully normally wants out of a manual is how do I solve my problem? So you kind of want to invert it to rather than saying, you know, this button attacks the enemy. You want to invert it to say to attack the enemy, press this button. Because you as a player have a job you want done Mm -hmm. and you want to know what part of the interface or what part of the game system is going to allow you to do that. Um, and I remember having to do almost a just stem to stern rewrite on the eye of the beholder manual because I had done it feature based and I needed to make it, you know, task based and it improved it immensely. And that was just one of those things where my editor called me on it and said, you, you know, better than this, go do it again. It's kind of a fascinating, maybe not as, maybe it doesn't get the attention it deserves, but just the the sort of mechanics of a game and how it teaches you how to play it. You know, how do people learn? Yeah. You know, that can be done poorly <laughs> or really well, you know. Well, 
the things that you get people to do very early in their game experience will often set their expectations for this is how I solve problems. Mm -hmm. You know, if you tell every, if you somehow emphasize one particular characteristic of the game or one particular capability, people will think to themselves, oh, I'm, I want to maximize this stat. I want to, you know, I, I always need to maneuver when I fight enemies or what's really important is I have to pick exactly the right weapon to fight the enemy that's in front of me. So I guess I better research the enemies before I attack them. I mean, every one of those is a legitimate game design. Um, what gets to be a problem sometimes is when you kind of lead players toward one particular play style. Mm. And then later in the game, that play style isn't effective anymore, or it's not a good, and, and now you have to, and it's much harder to teach them, teach it to hold dog new tricks halfway through a game. Yeah, I've been there a few times. <laughs> so you worked on uh, a game called Dragons of Flame. I'm not sure if you did that before or after at the same time as you're working on Curse. Um, trying to remember which one Dragons was. Or Dragons of Flame. Let me see if I got a picture of it. It's quite a bit. I think it's also a sequel to a game called uh, Heroes of the Lance. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's yeah, that was basically the side-scrolling uh, more action oriented Dungeons and Dragons game as opposed to the sort of turn based role playing version of the game. And this is the Commodore version. I think there's a NES version of this. Yeah, NES. Yeah. And then uh, the ST and Amiga. Yeah, those were done in um, in England, and it was I actually got to fly to England and spend some time there with the development teams. Uh, they were originally, I think, developed as ST and Amiga games, and then a different development house did the Commodore sixty four versions, and that was that was very challenging to take what was originally you know, uh, a game that would run in 512K on an Atari ST or an Amiga and making it fit in a Commodore 64 was, you know, took a very skilled development team to make that happen. So and I again, we, the idea was we wanted, you wanted to do something a little bit more action oriented or yeah, I mean, we wanted to try to, SSI wanted to try to hit, you know, every genre that made sense to people. And, uh, you know, certainly there were plenty of people playing action-oriented, you know, more arcade-like games. So let's see what we can do to make that happen. And, you know, the... <coughs> Pardon me. That was, there were also, the other thing was there were just so many great worlds that TSR had mm -hmm. and all of our gold box and Eye of the Beholder games were set in the um, Forgotten Realms. And we just wanted to say, well, could we do games in other environments to bring in different kinds of players? Was that fairly successful spin? I get, can we call it a spinoff series? I don't know, what, whatever we want to call it was the... It was a parallel series. It, it did fine. I mean, it was enough. It was good enough for a sequel, but mm -hmm. we didn't end up making more than two. I don't remember. I don't think. Whereas gold box games, we made quite a pile. Of them. <laughs> you know, if you guys had just continued to make them, I would still be behind them. <laughs> Wouldn't matter to me. Well, that's really why the, what the, you know, the last one was really the, the dungeon masters kit where you could, build your own and share them out with people. And, um, you know, that was, we felt we were kind of at the end of the gold box era as mm -hmm. it were, but we knew that there were people that might want to continue to play them. So we wanted to 
give them a mechanism for doing that. I think it's one of those things where had there been robust online communities for sharing those, which we were kind of a little early for, um, they probably would have had people playing because there were some some great things that uh, people just made in the game as well, in that uh, game as well. But, you know, I, I think it was a thing where the, the edit your own game existed, but we didn't have the community to make it a huge deal in the same way. You know, we've been, for some people, it's probably hard. Maybe some people don't even, I guess there's lots of people actually that would have, <laughs> they've never been without the internet. So they don't know what, you know, life was like before. You, you had a magazine, that was your connection to the gaming industry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm old enough to remember early on sending bug reports in via fax and working <laughs> with remote developers that way because we didn't have email yet oh sure yeah i didn't get online until must have been mid 90s anyway I and mean, i know there was genie and the prodigy and or aol i guess and stuff like that but never got into any of those well let's uh, talk a little bit about another one of my my favorites Curse of the sure. Azure Bonds. I mean, this is a. Uh, I remember when I played this back in the day. My first thought was, "Wow, there's a lot more sort of a narrative here." You know, that's what I with the thing with the or the sigils. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very interesting story. That, it was a novel. Yeah, here we go. And I had a novel. I don't know where I got it. There was a novelization, or I don't know. If, I'm kind of confused. Maybe I can get you to clear some stuff up about this because I found a. Yeah, there's the okay. So there's a module for the tabletop, right? So my oh. my memory of the order was that uh, Jeff Grubb, who was one of the main um, designers at TSR, mm -hmm. had uh, written the novel uh, Azure Bonds, or Curse of the Azure Bonds, and. Um, when we were looking for what we wanted to do as a sequel to Pool of Radiance, that book had was either just about to come out or had just come out. And we read through it, kind of went, yeah, okay. I think we could make a game based on this. And so I had finished up working on the Apple II and Commodore 64 versions of Pool. And the rest of the team was working on the IBM version. And that was a big, you know, that was like a ground up rewrite because it's a completely different system and graphics and everything. So I was kind of shunted into a different room. And basically, they basically said, go figure out our next game. Pool had taken much longer and had cost more than any game SSI had ever done. Mm -hmm. And so how could we, if, if, if every gold box game was going to take that long and cost that much, it was going to be a challenge for the company. You know, it's, we've learned a lot from this first game, figure out what sequels should look like and how do we make them in a way where players are really going to want to play them, where we're going to continue to get strong sales and really get players to enjoy what they're doing, but that it doesn't cost as much and take as long as the first one had done. And so um, I sat down and, and talked through things with Jeff Grubb and we kind of worked out um, a storyline that was kind of a sequel to the original novel mm -hmm. where um, the character on the cover of the novel would be somebody you would meet and you would interact with, but they weren't, uh, you weren't gonna basically play through exactly the same situation as they had. And Jeff knew the Forgotten Realms super well. And so he and I kind of plotted out you know, here are the 
I think, you know, sort of one mission arc for each sigil on your arm. And so there was an opening that everybody would go through. And then from there, you could wander around the map and you could encounter the intermediate missions in any order you wanted to. And then once you had solved the intermediate missions, you would then open up the finale. So there was some flexibility at you wandering around the map was a thing you could do. Um, we actually, as one of the ways to save some effort was we got rid of the big wander around the square map that had been part of the overland in Pool of Radiance. And we just went to a single screen point to point map. Um, later, Gold Box Games decided that was a little too constricting. And then they allowed players to kind of wander square by square over the single screen map rather than the big overland from Pool of Radiance. So, um, yeah, I remember that beating Pool of Radiance, then it would say, but you can continue to wander this, you know, overland map and find. <clears throat> I thought that was cool. I think, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, <clears throat> I want to say the Savage Frontier series where they brought that back. That sounds familiar. Let's see beyond software. Yeah, world map travel mode, I think, came back with that. Yeah, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> with that. But yeah, yeah it's a yeah, I just remember that that was a great uh, great structure for that game and the, the sigils and everything. It really mm -hmm. I still remember it. Yeah. There was <laughs> uh, these games made such an impression. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also got a uh a another person who had done work in the tabletop role-playing game, a fellow named Steve Perrin to come. Yeah. So between sort of myself and Steve Perrin and Jeff Grubb, we had a lot of tabletop role-playing experience for laying out a storyline that made sense. And then we kind of crafted all of the missions that went into the, each of the story arcs. And part of that was laying them out so that they would fit on the different sides of a Commodore 64 or Apple II disc. Oh, yeah. So you would put <laughs> missions, yeah. You would put missions together that would share enemies or share wall section, 3D wall sections. These were very graphically expensive things that took up a lot of space on disc at the time. And so you know, the, the designers would go through and say, well, I'm, you know, I can have, if I can simplify my walls a little bit, I can have an extra monster. Or if I get rid of a monster, I can have some custom walls. Wow, to I make that granular. Wow. Moving through more interesting. So yeah. there were a lot of trade-offs like that, that, and that really in a lot of ways, what curse was, was spending a bunch of time planning beforehand so that when the team that had finished off the IBM port of pool were available to come start creating Curse of the Azure Bonds, they could hit the ground running. They had a lot of this pre-planning done for them. And then they could go through and, you know, add their own flourishes and their own individual elements. And all that pre-planning that was done, Jeff Grubb at TSR turned into the role-playing game module which he was very nice to give me a co-author credit on. I need to talk to Jeff at some point. He's, I was looking for a picture of him, but he seems it's hard to find. <laughs> He's, uh, it's funny how Wikipedia sometimes has pictures and sometimes don't. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what, what was I going to ask you about? Oh, yeah, so the... Again, I have to ask you this. I'm not quite sure because uh, I just have the years here <laughs> to go on. Uh, but at some point, you worked on I, I the Beholder 2. So I guess uh, that's that after the Savage Frontier. Or some... So uh, did um, I the Beholder 1. Um, that was 91. Yeah. Okay, so they're a little bit mixed up. Oh, I see what happens. they got two different... <laughs> yeah. Got a design credit list and then a production list. Okay, so you 
right. Developed by the Beholder, it says here, nineteen ninety one, and Gateway to the Savage Frontier, nineteen ninety one. There's actually five games <laughs> listed here for nineteen ninety one. Were you? Is that possible? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, what what happened was so the Gold Box games originally sort of Pool Radiance, Curse of the Azure Bonds, later the the Crin uh, games that were done. Um, those were done in-house at SSI. The designers, artists, the developers were all employees and contractors mm -hmm. and were on site. And I worked with them on Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds. And after shipping Curse, you know, I'd been, that'd been several years, you know, I'd, I'd worked probably three years or two and a half years internally shipping those couple of games and i talked with my managers and said you know i think there's you know obviously we've got gold box games and the in-house team is going to keep doing those and making them better and adding new levels and adding new features to them but i also think there's big opportunities working with great external development houses to create new games either gold box games that other third parties can build or, uh, you know, other kinds of D and D games or non D and D games. And so I transitioned from working with the in-house teams to working with the contract development teams on the outside. And, you know, that's how I ended up with, you know, five or six games <laughs> in, in one year was because I'd often have several games going at the same time with different development teams. And games were much smaller back then. Oh, well, that's, that's true. Yeah, this gateway, I'm looking at this gateway to the Savage Frontier. I thought we could, I think this one was one of the ones, <clears throat> yeah, Beyond Software. Is this Don? Uh, Don Daglo? Don Daglo, yes. So mm -hmm. this was, yeah, I found a Stormfront Studios in 1988. Yeah, this was a great, you know, I had all these games. <laughs> if it was a gold box, hey, I'm going to buy that thing. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't even know if I realized it was, you know, just playing them back in the day. I don't even think I would have noticed this was a different team or. You know, that seemed, was on purpose, you know. <laughs> it just seemed like it's just another, you know, fun set of games. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that was part of it was because, you know, all of the test group that we had internally at uh, SSI worked on both the in-house games and the contract games. Uh, so, and I had worked on the in-house gold box games, so I could give advice on how to make the third parties make games that felt like the games they were, were being built in house, mm -hmm. you know, this is the things that had worked for us. These are the things that hadn't, you know, you guys can come up with new, new ideas or, you know, retry some old ones that maybe a new spin on something that didn't work for us the first time. Um, but yeah, gateway was the first game that was done Part of it was that the company that was doing that uh, beyond was also building an MMO version, oh, not really an MMO, an online version of the gold box system through. It was never Winter Nights on AOL, I think, right? I think so. Yeah. Amer America Online. Yeah. And so pretty much in learning to build the online version, they learned a lot about the way the game worked. And so uh, we ended up hiring them. We made a deal with them to build the, the Savage Frontier games. I never got and a I chance to with play this Gateway. Song. And then there was a sequel, but somebody else worked on the sequel with them. Uh, Treasures, I think. Treasures of the Savage. Got it right there. Treasures of the Savage Frontier. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, this was a. Yeah, you know, America Online. I wish I'd have gotten to play this. If I'd had access to this, you talk about a AOL bill. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
So I guess you, you probably did. Did you work on that or have any much to do with the online? No, I, I really wasn't involved in the online version of the game. That had been set up before I kind of got involved. What you did work on I. Beholder. This was a big, really big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I've covered this on the show before, but you know, hopefully people could see that <laughs> quite a you know, this is how to describe this. It's probably is it right to say it's 3D or is there some kind of yeah, I mean some people call it two and a half D. It two and a half D. I not, don't I don't I don't have I've never been able to understand the difference. <laughs> no. I mean it's segmented movement though. I mean you move from square to square on the map and it redraws the 3D point of view in front of you. In some ways it was the PC, you know, larger viewport version of the same basic kind of technology they were doing for that Westwood had sold us for um, the gold box games. But this was a game where you just always were in that point of view. And the combat uh, was now kind of real time with cooldown, where you would sit there and click each weapon when it, or spell and it would attack. And then it would come back after so many seconds, depending on the weapon type and the character who was wielding it, stuff like that. A lot of ways, these were more intense or scary. Or <laughs> um, well, certainly, uh, it absolutely could be scarier. I mean, I think the most brilliant thing in this game was that um, all the different bad guys had sound effects for when they were moving around. Mm -hmm. And the audio was smart enough that it would let you hear them at different volumes, depending on how far away they were, which meant that you could come up to a wall or a door or something and actually hear something moving on the other side of it. And the scare, one of the scariest things in the game were the, were the poisonous spite, giant poisonous spiders. Cause of course if poison was save or die back in old D and D days. And so you would roll up to a door and you'd listen and you'd hear the giant spider scuttling around on the other side. Oh. And you knew there was no other way through the dungeon than through that darn door. And so there was tremendous, just wonderful tension that kind of came up organically out of combining all the different pieces that Westwood had put together. I the Beholder was very much Westwood's game. They, they did the design work on it and, um, you know, my job there was just to kind of make sure it was as D&D like as possible and to help bring it over the finish line. I always wondered, I mean, I assume they had played the Dungeon Master game. I think that was. Yeah, would surprise me. But this, of course, had the real or the Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> rules. <Right. laughs> the pretty big difference. I mean, but I like like all of them, but yeah. yeah. Well, there were there were several people. I mean, the, I vaguely remember Dungeon Master being the first sixteen bit game I saw that used that kind of layered move square to square three D. Um, although it had been around for a while, the um, I think the Ultima games did did that a lot um, originally on the six on the eight bit systems, but. You can go back to wizardry, I guess. Yeah, wizard wizardry. That would be the right one. Yeah, wizardry did a lot, and then dungeon master just kind of upgraded the look and feel, and basically created a new bar that everybody had to go after. And I think added the kind of real time combat elements. Wizardry, I think, was more turn based, is my memory. I think so. <laughs> Just too many games. Yeah, that was yeah. way that one was really early. So yeah, I'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah, but I know a lot of folks. You know they uh, they're they're as fond of Eye of the Beholder. That was sort of their entry. <clears throat> you know, for me, yeah. it was, for me, it was a pool of radiance. But I know plenty of folks that are 
you know, just as crazy about that series. Yeah. Well, uh, I, the beholder, the Amiga version was probably the best version of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Westwood really did a, a, a nice job of upgrading from the EGA graphics to the graphics that the Amiga could support with the better color palettes and such. And they added some uh, additional work at the end of the game in the finale that made actually winning the game that much more, that much more exciting. Hmm. That's good to know. So if anybody's playing it, <laughs> you know, usually GOG or good old games uh, usually has the, I think the DOS version is up there. Yeah. yeah. But that's a good, a good one there to look for the Amiga version. All right, well, let's see what else we got here. Spell Jammer. That's a different kettle of fish there, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, I actually was only peripherally associated with Spell Jammer. Um, that, was done, uh, that was done by one of the third parties, I think, and I was, tech. Um, I was listed as producer, but the, in that case... I was more managing an associate producer who was uh, helping make sure that it got out. There were a number of games, like Tre Treasures of the Savage Frontier was the same thing. Really, Eye of the Beholder 2. Those were all games where um, even Great Naval Battles and some of these other games where I was the listed as producer and was responsible for making sure the game shipped on time. But um, the associate producer was the person who was really um, involved in the day-to-day -day decisions on making sure the game was solid. Yeah. yeah, somebody actually one of the questions I had somebody sent in for you was uh, they wanted to know like what is the difference between like producing and project managing and there's several <laughs> different titles here and is there really a is it how do you <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, you answer. there's a bunch of different responsibilities that right. different companies call different things. <clears throat> so um, Electronic Arts created the producer title because they were copying <laughs> the music industry where they wanted their the people at Electronic Arts who were managing third parties who were creating games to be like a record producer who was kind of putting the elements together, but that the third party were really the creative geniuses that drove the product. And so for a long time, people in the game industry used the title producer to talk about the people at a publisher who were responsible for a game, but not necessarily responsible for the artistic components at a deep level. Um, then you had kind of nowadays in a lot of cases, those would be called product managers. Um, that title is kind of morphed into what they call it in the software industry, as opposed to what they call it in the music industry. Um, then project manager is really about making the trains run on time you know, getting the, whatever the product is through all the steps of, of publication. Um, it's, you don't assume that there's a lot of, that's not where necessarily the artistic choices lie, mm -hmm. but it's the people that make, you know, when I'm doing project management, it's, you know, are you hitting your deadlines? Are there any issues? Are there concerns that we need to deal with? Have we done every one of the 150 steps necessary to get this product out the door? Have we chosen the artwork for the box? And do we have the copy for everything? And has legal signed off? And well, you know, what'd you do, George? And you just got somebody that was kind of procrastinating. And <laughs> do you ever run into that problem? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. At the, the, the classic problem was not that people weren't trying hard. Oh, sure. It's that a lot of times this is really hard stuff to do right. Mm -hmm. And you run into a problem that you're trying to do something for the first time. And you kind of like, 
at one point, I think it was um, in the Crin, the or no Gateway to the Savage Frontier. I think that was, I think that was the first Gold Box game that had digitized sound effects for the uh, PC, and that decision was made relatively late. And so we had to find a place to source the sound effects that would sound cool because we'd never done it before. We didn't have any. And so it was like, can, can I find somebody who can do that? And how much, are, how much is a reasonable amount to pay for that? And how much effort is it? And how do we make sure that there's not any copyright issues with the sound effects they're sending us and all the things that go with that? And you know, there were some of them where the the sound effects person sent them to us and they were too big because we were very RAM constrained at the time. And so I can remember sitting in front of my PC with audio editing software, <laughs> just kind of massacring the, the sound effects one at a time to make them as small as possible and still have them sound pretty good. And you would kind of go, okay, I'm really willing to put a lot of ram into making sure a lot of memory into making sure the um fireball sounds good because that just it has to sound good oh yeah when you throw that you want to have it be feel powerful and to have it work where it was kind of okay to massacre the magic missile a little bit if it <laughs> sounded a little bit more like a pew pew sound that was it was not supposed to be your big heavy hitter spell <laughs> so you know, that was, you just, you did whatever you needed to do to get something out the door. Um, An image of you sitting there in front of a computer playing like, oh, <laughs> these different sound effects. That's probably not something people, you know, when they think, oh, I want to be, you know, I want to get or be part of the games industry. They, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of thing they probably don't anticipate having to do, but, you know, somebody's got to do it, you know, it's got to get, got to get done. It's, it really, it, all these all this game work is all about constraints. Mm -hmm. You, you have limited time, limited budget. People have certain skills or not skills. There are technical limitations. There's lots of different stakeholders that have to sign off on something. I mean, if you're doing a licensed game, you know, we would have to make sure that everything we did pass through TSR and TSR would come back with comments or questions or issues and, you know, sometimes we could explain ourselves and convince them that what we were doing was in the spirit of their game. And mm -hmm. other times they'd put their foot down and say, nope, we need it to work like this. And it was like, all right, it's your game. We'll uh, figure it out. Uh, do you remember some of those things that came up? That would be my oh. while I know. <laughs> this wasn't specifically TSR. This was actually an internal bit but it's somewhat like that um keith bores was wizard of a programmer and did a lot of amazing work on the game one of the elements he worked on was the tactical ai and in pool of radiance and the early gold box games the ai basically when it was a wizard's turn to cast a spell it would pick an enemy on the enemy side and center the spell on the enemy. And so if there was a fireball, if there were people around him, around that enemy, they would get attacked as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, Keith was a smart guy and he'd done, he'd been doing this AI for a while. So he said, well, what if it starts by targeting an enemy and then it just starts checking the squares around it until it says, well, where should I put this fireball to catch the most people, the most enemies that I could possibly get? Mm -hmm. And so when we first put that in, it was like, wow, suddenly those enemy sorcerers were way more effective than they'd been before because the computer got really good at just hitting all of your guys and none of its own. 
um, we'd had for a while a switch that said, when I target a fireball, I'm going to try to target this guy, but do I have any, will it hit any friends? And then should that matter to the enemy? So, you know, just playing around with, you know, how much was the enemy willing to torch its own people or how much did it want to recenter the fireball to make sure who it got? Mm -hmm. um, it would actually lead to a problem where we had, we'd, we'd sort of built 90% of the game and then Keith came up with this new innovation and it was like, oh, we're going to have to rebalance the entire game now because everywhere there's a, a sorcerer, the game is unbalanced or a wizard. Um, so my memory is that we didn't include that right away because we didn't have time to go through and rebalance the whole rest of the game. Um, but that was the kind of thing where somebody comes up with what's a good idea, but you just, you don't necessarily have your constraint is time for making it work. And then you pick it up and you use it later when you can, uh, do the right thing with it. Yeah, that would have been challenging. You know, I always thought, just I always think about fireballs. I don't know. Did you ever play a Baldur's Gate? Uh, I played the Baldur's Gate games on the console, mm -hmm. uh, which were the more sort of vaguely Diablo-esque real-time games. I didn't actually play the turn-based PC ones. I just remember, speaking of fireballs, that was one of the things I liked so much about the, the gold box engine, because you could properly line up a fireball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. whereas in those since the real time with pause or whatever so hard not to end up uh, torching like half your your party you know you really had to be on top of it so <laughs> okay. you know, yeah. i just never even bothered with fireballs my my memory as an example for tsr is i think and it's long enough ago that i could be wrong but i think we originally fireballs were supposed to conform to the area of the uh, of the 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 area they were thrown in in Dungeons and Dragons at that time. So if you had a a long skinny corridor, it would take a big you know circular fireball and turn it into an extremely long oh. thin thing that would just fill a corridor for hundreds of feet in every, each direction. Um, and we had to kind of convince. We had to talk to TSR and say we just want to basically say it's just going to do a circle and if it hits a wall that will stop it but we're not going to expand the circle based on how much it it's limited by the walls and they agreed with us that that was okay i didn't really think about it before i would have done now would that have made it more challenging well the the problem you had was if in a like a narrow corridor yeah you had to throw the fireball way the heck down the corridor because it was going to wash back so far yeah, and part of it was also just our 8-bit system at the time it wasn't obvious how to make the fireball conform to the space in a way that was predictable for users and easily understandable you know just thinking one of the other things i like so much about the gold box games is if you get to a point in a battle where it was obvious you were going to win and the enemies would start surrendering. <laughs> I, thought, I love it. I mean, it's such a time saver and it makes you feel good at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I wish more games would do that. Have that sort of mechanic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you had enough of a advantage over somebody, you could use the auto battle and where it would just finish off the, you could use it to finish off the battle if you wanted to in the later games. I know it would do that. I don't know if I ever used that. You mean all the like a quick combat type? Yeah. Thing? You could just trigger quick combat, which, you know, I, you would only want to do if you had a kind of overwhelming thing because the, the computer was not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would want to use it. <laughs> right. yeah. You know, hard enough when you're like micromanaging every, every, that's the fun part anyway, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
Well, that's a the rendering came up later as well. That was, I think, that was one of the things that got added later in the game. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We've got a couple other games here that we could talk about if if you got the time. I don't know how you're 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 okay. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Yeah, just a couple other ones here that kind of I was curious about. You know, this one is not a. This one is just a strategy, not a role playing game, right? It's. A, sorry, it's, I'm not. Which oh, game is it? I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. No greater glory. Oh, no, no greater glory. Yes. There's a lot that's interesting about this. One is that it comes with a novel. It says in, inside the classic novel, the Red Badge of Courage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember reading that. I think it was back in the. Was it eleventh grade or tenth grade? I think we read that. Mm-hmm. So this, yeah, it was an interesting uh, game because it had been put uh, together by somebody who was um, a historian. Yeah, and so it had a lot of interesting choices that weren't just kind of tactical battlefield choices. You really were managing the Civil War from a both political and military point of view. It looks like this is, is this an Amiga version? Uh, it looks like the PC version with the EGA graphics. That's just my guess. So this was probably one of the ones. It's got you listed as a, as a designer on that. No, it says game was design category, but <laughs> game developer. So I don't know yeah. what your actual role was on it. <laughs> I was more I was more producer on that one. That was again one of those games by a third party. Um, and part of the challenge there was that the person who was doing it was incredibly well versed in the subject, but they didn't necessarily have um some of the third parties we worked with had just a huge amount of game development experience. And this was somebody who kind of had more of the knowledge about the, the particular subject matter. Um, and they were, they could do the game development, but they're, they weren't maybe the wizard that some of the uh, other third party teams were. It looks like and so helping them, you know, get over the finish line making sure the testing was done well was really the focus of it. I could be confident that they would get the history right. Okay. (laughs) Kind of an important for a Civil War game. And this one is, again, I'm not quite sure. It's called uh, Medieval Lords, Soldier Kings of Europe. Trying to remember. Let's see what it lists. Screenshots of that one? It says you're a developer again. Yeah, we could get some screenshots. Uh, it looks a little bit like that Civil War game, but there's not much in the way of screenshots. Oh, okay. I, I think the thing I remember about Medieval Lords was that each of the areas that you had were had a lot of different kind of uh, cultural and um, so basically it was like understanding the area you were in and you could see why some places that had you know linguistic things in common or other cultural elements in common why a particular um empire or civilization might expand to fulfill all these areas that had um, Hmm. elements in common, but then you'd come across the border and like on the other side of the border, you'd find people that were very different. And it was very challenging to both conquer them and integrate them into your, into your side, because there were enough cultural differences that you would have to like put a lot of troops there or something to keep them from rebelling. So this was another one of those ones that had a lot of kind of interesting sociological and history in it. Uh, And again, the person I was working with, you know, knew the history part really well. 
Um, but the technical part, they were good enough to get the game out, but they weren't necessarily the wizards that, you know, if you went talking to the people at Beyond Software, who'd been doing lots of different games for many years, um, that was a challenge. So I mean, it's still yeah. pretty cool. They were willing to work with folks like that, that, you know, Hey, we recognize this person really just major history buff, you know, so we're yep. going to work. I mean, that's pretty cool. It was interesting oh, because <laughs> SSI's strategy games. So their D and D games sold a lot more than their strategy games for a very long time. And Late in my time at SSI, they decided to put, kind of take some of the stuff they'd learned about making the the D and D games very approachable and you know really good looking graphics and such, and apply them to um, what was the general series of games. The was it Panzer General, I think. Um, yeah, Panzer Strike. No, th this wasn't one that I was involved with, it, but uh, other than I, I think I wrote the proposal that we reviewed in the uh, yearly meeting and it got the green light and then somebody else got picked as the uh, producer for it. So, but that's that was really when they started selling strategy games that sold on the same kind of order of magnitude as their as their D, &D games it was because they learned how to improve the presentation and the ease of use doing the role-playing games and then applied it to the more casual strategy games yeah joel billings i've had yeah. him on the show before yeah he's seen he struck i want to say he said that he preferred the war games i think he still works on those Oh yeah. 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 Joel was the role-playing games were never his strong suit. He was very much a historical and strategy gamer. And, you know, SSI was, he was the head of the company all the time that I was there. Like a nice guy. Was he fun to work with? A very nice guy. Very fun to work with. Very, he was very, he was like very often the smartest guy in the room, but he didn't have to make a big deal out of it. Hmm. You know, he had amazing instincts. He would cut right to the heart of an issue. Um, and he was in incredibly fair. He was a really nice guy to work with and work for. Sounds great. <laughs> well, I got, uh, I guess, let's see, maybe one last question for you. I want I'll double check just to make sure I didn't miss any uh, fan submitted questions. But uh, I got several folks. I know this is probably not one of the games that you work a lot on, or I don't know what you know what you had might have had to do with it. But Star Control Three, it says you did the dialogue. Um, I was involved in that, so uh, I had moved from SSI to Accolade, mm -hmm. and. Um, at Accolade, one of the things that we'd looked at were we'd had a couple of different changes in management. And one of the things we looked at is we said, what are the, the games that Accolade had done in the past that we might be able to do sequels to that people would think well of? Mm -hmm. And Star Control 2 was one of the greatest games ever made. And, you know, Toys for Bob and uh, the people that had developed it just is a brilliant, brilliant game. And unfortunately, they were not available to work on the sequel. Um, but Accolade did have the rights to do a sequel. So we ended up uh, reaching out to Legend Entertainment. And Legend... Their background was more in um, kind of point and click adventure games that had evolved into storytelling games. And so we ended up talking with them and 
hired them to to do Star Control Three, and ultimately there were some decisions made that at the time seemed like a good idea in terms of like having a 3D map instead of a 2D map and um, a few other things like that. In, instead of driving around on the planets, we had a sort of uh, base building, city building kind of system. <coughs> and I think they was very pretty. And I think it played pretty well. I mean, it got a, I don't know, 91% or something from uh, PC Gamer, but it wasn't the, it wasn't the classic that Star Control 2 was. It was a good game. The people that did it, I think did some great work. Um, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to follow on a, a legend. You know, you can okay. sometimes you can make something that's good, but not quite as great as the as that one that it came from. Uh, lots of fun stuff in that. The at the time, CGI for characters was still really expensive and not great looking yet. There were real uncanny valley problems, and so we had a choice between trying to do hand-drawn aliens or 3D CGI aliens or we wondered if it was possible to actually do what they would do in a TV show or a movie at the time, which was puppetry. And so the people I'd worked with at uh, Hero Games back when I was doing the tabletop role-playing, a couple of them had gone down to Hollywood and were doing special effects for kind of inexpensive sci-fi movies and horror movies. And so we ended up hiring them to do uh, all the aliens for the, the scenes where you talk to the aliens and they ended up, you know, creating puppets and 3d, you know, actual physical interiors and uh, mm -hmm. videoing them and putting, hooking them up to a, a rig where they would, you know, use joysticks and stuff to control them so that the aliens would animate and open their mouths and wiggle their eyebrows and move their eyes about and do all that kind of stuff. And that was super exciting. It was really yeah, like fun. It was a lot of fun to do that. So, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of interesting stuff for Star Control 3. It did okay. You know, learned a lot. The last game that's listed here until it's got you listed for uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Collector's Edition, but <laughs> yeah, just just scraping it all together and still being listed as part of that. So, did you leave the games industry at some point? And... Yeah, I um, basically left uh, Accolade after about five, so I was about about five years at SSI. And about five years at Accolade. And I'd been five years at Hero Games doing tabletop role-playing games before that. And late in my career at Accolade, one of my fellow producers came over and was doing a snowboarding game. And he said, oh, I just got, we just made a deal with a company that represents a bunch of indie bands and we've got this really great soundtrack that we're going to have for our game and i've got the cd of like 17 tracks from these indie bands that we're going to use in the snowboarding game and i went oh that sounds amazing he said can i can i listen and he said sure here's you know and he handed me the cd and i went and listened to it and i liked about two of the songs oh <laughs> And I thought to myself, you know, I think I'm getting a little far from my target demographic. I'm not sure my tastes are such that I can really produce the work that the young people that I'm targeting are going to be, they're, they're really going to be excited about. And uh, I basically had a midlife crisis. 
And so rather than going out and buying a Corvette, I uh, went and got my MBA, you know, quit the game business, went and got my MBA and then uh, uh, ended up joining Yahoo and then have been in the tech biz ever since. But I I feel, any, do you have regrets or it doesn't sound like you're really. Well, I mean, I, I love the work that I do and that I've been doing. Um, do I miss it? Yeah, sometimes. I still do game design on the side just for myself. Hmm. I mean, if I try to understand a problem or uh, something that's happening in the world, I'll build a little spreadsheet or a simulation for it, even if I never publish it anywhere. Um, you know, when COVID hit and I was kind of stuck working remotely for a couple of years, uh, hacked out a pencil and paper solo version of World War II in the European theater just to just stretch people. the old game designer muscles. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn that into something. Uh. No, I mean, not right now. I've got a drawer full of half finished stuff that I do. I work on them until I feel like I understand it. And then I go on to other things. So don't really have a race to publish right now. Hey, Ria. Well, George, it's been, it's been great talking to you. I don't know if we, did we cover all the topics that I hope I didn't uh, miss anything. Uh, no, I, I think it's fair. That's really appreciate uh, getting a chance to talk to you. And I you know, super appreciate your interest in uh, all the games and stuff. It was oh, so many people work. I mean, this is my childhood. Hard stuff and not even childhood this is just my life you know <laughs> into adult <laughs> you know one thing i was going to ask just to kind of to wrap things up a little bit i know a lot of folks watch this show they're also um, interested in their own development you know tinkering around maybe some you know some actually do work on like commercial projects and things of that sort but uh mm -hmm. You know, just in general, somebody that's got all this production experience and working with people, do you, you know, what would your advice be to somebody that, you know, you got this idea, you, you want to make this game, you know, how do you get this, <laughs> how do you get all the way from, you know, the idea phase to the, you know, what, what tends to be the, uh, the stumbling blocks, I guess? Well, there's never been a better time for somebody to try to get a game idea out in front of people. The, the tools for doing that, that are available either for free or very cheap, the, the instruction that you can get, the, the tutorials and other things like that that are available are just mind blowing compared to the stuff that was available back in when I was doing this in the eighties and nineties. Um, and, there really aren't gatekeepers. I mean, you can just publish a thing and you end up in an app store or up on Steam or wherever else. And suddenly, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people can potentially download. It. Doesn't mean they will because <laughs> there are hundreds or thousands of other people doing the same thing. But um, so the ability to actually create things and get them in front of people, those were huge barriers back in my day because you had to work through publishers. You had to find a way to get into the game stores or the retail stores. And that just meant they were gatekeepers in your way. You know, there were all the technical challenges, but there were also all the gatekeepers. Well, the gatekeepers are kind of gone and about half the technical challenges are gone too because you can learn Unity or yeah, I was just thinking that. Whatever else. That history guy that we were talking about, you know, he could have, you know, if that was somebody today, they could pick up Unity and, right, you know, go that way. Um, I think the, the thing that I've seen that is most successful are finding um, people to work with, find a group, find other people that are doing this kind of thing and figure out what you can contribute. Um. You know, the idea that there's somebody out there who's great at making AI happen while there's somebody else that's a wizard with Blender 
and can make assets that look great and somebody else that just does music and uh, some third, another person that can make designs that are really unique looking. Um, if you're doing something that's fun or if you can find a group of people that are doing something you can get excited about, just get involved, ship things, get involved with people that are, that can actually get something over the line. And every time you ship a thing, you have, it's just unique experience. There's nothing like saying this is done enough that I'm going to go let humans play it. People I've never met are going to put time and effort and get enjoyment out of a thing that I helped build. And the, the best feeling in the world for me was when I met somebody that I, when I talked to somebody I'd never met before, I mean, sort of like yourself saying, and I really love playing pool or I really love playing curse or I the boulder or whatever else. Um, anytime, any of the products that I worked on, even the stuff I do now from a technology standpoint, um, if you hear somebody saying, I used the thing you built and it made my life better. I was happy. I was excited. I was engaged. I learned something. I met some other people. Um, that's the best feeling in the world. And finding, and the way to do that successfully is find other people to work with. And if there's a thing you need to do, but you're not great at it yet, find a mentor. Find somebody who knows how to do it that you can ask questions to. There's a statistic, I think, when they talk about um, new programmers trying to actually complete a project. And this is not just for games. This can be for anything. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing, and if you look at all the reasons why somebody does or doesn't finish a project, who's new, who's doing it for the first time, the most predictive thing about whether they'll be successful or not is if they have a mentor, hmm. you know, because if you can get, if you can solve 90% of your problems, but you're banging your head against the screen and that last 10% and somebody who's been there before can look and just say, Oh, you forgot to link this or you're missing a semicolon or something, you know, or whatever it is. And then you kind of go, ah, oh, and now you're productive again. Now you're over that hump and you're moving to the next step. But if you're all by yourself trying to do a thing, it can be done. Absolutely. Lots of great stuff gets done that way. But getting over the barriers can be a challenge. So find friends. Yeah, I'm just doing my own little projects here. I can't tell you how many times I've had that. Yeah, we'd be stuck on something days sometimes and then finally i'm like why don't i just get some help with this you know <laughs> yep. get on a forum or something and yep oh you know and almost always just something really simple yeah or some limit that you didn't know about yeah you well, know you gotta, yeah this thing over whatever you know oh what i didn't even know that thing was there you know? <laughs> yep yep yeah absolutely so well, again it's been, it's been a great time george if you had a good good chat I yeah, have fun. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. I really appreciate well, uh, you reaching out. It's been a good time. You decided to take some of those uh, old uh, game ideas out of the drawer and <laughs> do something with those. You have to let me know. Will do. Thanks, Matt. Have a good evening. Thank you for making such great games. I'm tempted to fire this up now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to it. Thanks again. All right. Talk to you later. Bye bye. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. A lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, we'll be speaking to uh, Evan Robinson next. I just wrapped up that interview. It's in the can, uh, not yet produced, obviously. Uh, but that's going to be really, really good, too. Lots of great stories, again, about these early days. Uh, he talks in there about a early days of electronic arts as well as uh, what it was work like uh, what it was like working with Gary and Dave Arneson back in TSR uh, back in TSR in the early uh, 80s 1980 
Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy that interview, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Yes, you. <laughs> You dirty old rats. Yes, I want to thank all of you for supporting Matchette, keeping these shows in production. Folks, we're almost to 500. <laughs> you know, I can almost smell the cheese from here. I think it's, you know, 10 episodes away. I'm going to do something uh, super special for that sort of grand finale. I haven't yet quite uh, decided what I'm going to be able to do uh, for that, but it will be something special that I can promise you. Uh, but I wouldn't have been able to make it this far without you and your support. Uh, folks, if for whatever reason, you know, if you like Matchette, uh, support the show. You know, it's just you know, that simple. Don't ask uh, for a lot of money here. Not trying to get rich off this. Uh, just a buck a show. <laughs> That's all I'm asking, you know. Hopefully you can afford that. Just uh, pop over to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site and join the team. Uh, and then you can access the Discord chat and see all the great stuff uh, from other people like you who, who uh, love this stuff and appreciate it. Uh, so anyway, if you've already done that, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. If you have not done that, please consider doing it as soon as possible. <laughs> you know, before the episode 500, you really want to get your uh, uh, support in. So thank you. Uh, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> First up, Michael Selva. He's been sort of the reporter on the beat this time. Uh, first up is a new, new interview with George Zeitz, uh, one of my favorite people. Another big, uh, you know, he comes on the show, he's a great guest, but then he helps me to line up uh, other people to get on the show and, you know, helps promote the show. I mean, <laughs> the best possible kinds of guests. Uh, but anyway, uh, George, uh, this is an interview on Game Banshee, another friend of the show, a great website. Uh, but he talks on there about his previous projects, Digimancy Entertainment, this uh, new project he's working on. Uh, a little clue about it, he says it's inspired by a combination of real-world history and ancient philosophical tradition and one of my all-time favorite fantasy settings. So still a little bit vague, uh, you know, a little tease. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could speculate about what this game's about, which is probably what George wants us to do. Just uh, imagine the possibilities. Good old George. Uh, and then uh, also Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous, another great game. Loved it. Played it all the way through. Uh, that's getting an enhanced edition uh, as well as a console release and new DLC. This is slated for the 29th of September. So you'll be, somebody will be back in school or back at work and then you have this great game that you're yearning to play. Oh, if only it had come out when you had the time. <laughs> Isn't that always how it goes? Uh, let's see, what's it called? The Treasure of the Midnight Isles. Yeah. Third premium DLC for Pathfinder, uh, which will launch on the 11th of August, 2022. The islands scattered across the dark abyssal ocean hide treasures untold. So what's the actual date? So I see 29th of September listed here, and the, I guess the DLC slated for the 11th. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, not too far off, so definitely stay tuned for this. Let's see. Board the grim, cursed ship and venture into the unknown to find your fortune. So I don't know about you guys. I really like that Pathfinder series, so uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that. Uh, also, Nox Archaeist, another good friend of the show. hope you guys are uh, playing the Nox Archaeist. It's got a new expansion uh, that's been announced. It's called Lord of Storms, coming on March 31st, 2023. Three new HD uh, V hard drive image for Apple II, Mac or PC. Brand new quest line, new mobs. That's monsters. <laughs> new unique items, new features including character renaming. Oh, there we go, and a PDF of the manual. Well, that's coming up. Uh, what else we got here? Oh yeah, this is uh, probably uh, some exciting for a lot of folks. I'm gonna see if I can get John. Uh, let me uh, back up. <laughs> so John Romero, <laughs> working on a new FPS. He's announced this. He's hiring people to work on this. Going to be using the Unreal Engine 5. He says it's an all-new FPS with a totally original new IP. Will be built with the Unreal Engine 5. Uh, so that's, of course, really exciting. We'll be see. Uh, you know, is this going to be <laughs> obviously something new? So we're not going to get that long-awaited sequel to Daikatana. Uh, but hopefully something really, really cool. You know, he's... Uh, it's kind of the daddy, if you will, <laughs> of a first-person shooter. So I'm going to really be, you know, everybody's going to be paying attention to this. 
Now, like I say, I'm trying to get him on on the show. I've kind of teased a little bit with him on Twitter. You know, we'll see if we can get some uh, get him to pay attention. You know, it's been a while since I had him on the show. <laughs> Be great to see him again uh, and chat with him. You know, I got to uh, interview him for that movie too, the uh, the gameplay story of the video game revolution. Uh, that was fun. You know, I'll never forget this. You know, he's such a great guy. Uh, and when we were interviewing him for that, he uh, he kind of messed up. His, he forgot about it or he got mixed up on his schedule. Or, you know, he's the type of guy, you're walking around with him at a, one of these gameplay or game uh, developer conventions. And he's like, everybody, you know, Joel, John, you know, he can't, he can't walk five feet without somebody stopping and, and chatting with him. You know, he's that sort of guy, uh, super... Uh, uh, super visible, you know. <laughs> He's, you can easily spot him in a crowd. Uh, but anyway, he felt kind of bad, I guess, for showing up late to the interview. Uh, so ended up taking us all out to, for steak dinner, you know, which was really cool. You know, getting to have a, <laughs> you know, steaks with uh, Romero. Yeah, you know, so something you remember forever. And uh, so anyway, hopefully we'll, we'll see. You know, maybe I can get him back on. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, uh, what else here? There's news about a new Fallout TV show, uh, Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, and much more. But uh, for those, I want you to go to that Discord channel. You know, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get access to that, and you can read about it there. So that in way of a little teaser to <laughs> join the Discord chat if you're already a patron, or if you're not, hey, take care of that. All right, uh, what about the Ale of the Week? Well, I found this little bottle. Uh, it's from a, uh, what is it, Surly, I think. And you could probably guess why I wanted to sample this. <laughs> Comes in a little box. Got the, probably the most awesome box I've ever seen a beer come in. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Darkness Russian Imperial Stout, which, you know, I've had that before, but I guess they do a different formulation every year. Barrel Age 2022, art by Justin Burko. It's a special release. Really cool box. I think I'm going to just keep the box. We'll see what the bottle looks like, but I mean, that just looks great on the shelf. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's get this little box open, see what's in here. Okay, so it's a can. Whoa. <laughs> that is some awesome artwork. You know, these guys are really. You know, if there was ever, you know, a company that was just perfect for a match yet, I mean, look at that artwork on the can. You know, I've just been rewatching The Hobbit and thinking about old Smog. <laughs> Does that kind of remind you of Smog? <laughs> I always thought it was Smog. I guess it's Smog. Some weird accent. Wow, you know, even the, it feels kind of cool. It doesn't feel like a regular can. Let's see, brewed in Minneapolis. In Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, uh, bourbon barrel aged Russian Imperial Stout. Rich, evil, and decadent. Okay. <laughs> you know, I almost hate to open this. It just looks so looks so cool. Uh, but let's go ahead and get it open though. See what this is all about. Got the drinking horn handy. Let's see, I don't want to splatter this. You know, I'm drinking this at room temperature. I think that's the way you're supposed to drink these these uh, stouts. Somebody told me that anyway. I thought I'd give it a try. You know, it is kind of more authentic. <laughs> you know, it's not like they had refrigerators back in the Middle Ages. No, don't they, uh, you know, I think I've heard that people in Britain, you know, you order a beer, it comes to the room temperature. I don't know if that's true or not. Some of you guys could tell me that, I'm sure. I'd like to know. Never been to Europe. Well, it smells really good. I kind of got the uh, a little bit of oatmeal aroma. You can definitely taste the cherry uh, aromas in this. Did I say you can taste the aroma? <laughs> That's how thick the aroma is. <laughs> yeah, very cherry. You can definitely smell that. I guess that bourbon. Uh, what did they say it was brewed in bourbon barrels or something like that? barrel aged. You know, you could smell some bourbon. Kind of a cherry chocolatey. And this, it always kind of reminds me of like a chocolate covered cherry. Let me put it in the drinking horn. I'm sure this is meant to be properly served. I'll pour it into my special horn for this. Yeah, you can hear it. Well, I guess you might not be able to hear it, but it's very fizzy. 
Ah, well, it smells really good. Let's give it a taste. Mm. Yeah, I think this was the right decision to serve this, uh, or to drink this at room temperature. It seems to bring out more of the flavors, actually. Uh, definitely taste that sort of oatmeal uh, flavor, a little bit of chocolate, maybe even a little toffee flavor. Uh, probably more on the sweet side than the bitter side. A little bit of a kind of coffee liqueur flavor. You know, if you had those coffee uh, liquors, kind of a little bit of that flavor in there. A whole lot of cherry. Um, probably not very hoppy. You know, this is sort of a chocolate, coffee, toffee. You know, those are the flavors that are really coming to mind. Uh, let me try it again here. Hmm. It's just really smooth and tasty. You know, I forgot to see what kind of alcohol content is on this, but uh, it doesn't taste alcoholic at all. You know, just really smooth, velvety, <laughs> velvety smooth and chocolatey drink. This is damn good stuff. Hmm. Yeah, that is uh, just, uh, you know, I think they've kind of knocked it out the park on this. Completely smooth, delicious. <laughs> you know, it better be. It is kind of expensive, but, you know, it's a collectible thing. You know, you're not going to drink six of these. Uh, so, yeah, if you can find this barrel-aged darkness, I mean, it's worth it just for the beautiful can in the, in the box. <clears throat> I mean, no question. Uh, five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, I think these guys should be really proud of what they've accomplished here. <laughs> it's just really, really good. Let me try it out of the glass here just to... Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably the smoothest uh, Russian Imperial Stout I've ever had. I mean, just, wow. Uh, <laughs> can't say enough good things about this one. You really, if you see if you can find it, uh, I think it's worth uh, seeking that out. All right, well, enough about Russian Imperial Stouts. Let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was uh, looking for quotes by George MacDonald, the novelist. He might have written some poetry, too. Uh, lots of great ones, actually. You know, you can see why this guy is so famous. Uh, but anyway, I thought this was a really good one. Kind of uh, resonated with me for some reason. Uh, we'll see what you think about it. It goes something like this. It is not in the nature of politics that the best men should be elected. The best men do not want to govern their fellow men. Hmm. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. That's what passes for wit on board our ship.